namaste michael welcome welcome to ahimsa conversations namaste. thank you so much for making time to be part of this series um so what is your earliest recollection of either the experience or the concept of non violence my earliest memory of non violence uh, has with has to do with my father and mother uh who were quakers uh which is a small religious group uh that is quite well known for its commitment to non violence and pacifism and uh i grew up in a family where there were no toy guns and i remember at about the age of 3 or 4 getting a water pistol from a neighbor uh who thought they were being nice who were trying to be nice uh and my parents uh disappeared that gun <laughs> uh as a very early uh age um and so i was grown up in a family where uh there wasn't uh uh the use of violence uh, perpetrated on children and we were not to, to go out and uh get into fights with other with other kids and so i was raised in this lovely household that was not just about not uh hurting other people but we were also deeply uh concerned about the welfare of others and fighting injustice and fighting violence because i've learned that it's to be a nonviolent person you not only need to uh act without violence or intention of violence but you also must be uh, actively engaged against violence and injustice both of those things so yeah I, and i've chosen to follow that path for my life so far anyway so where did you go to college and how did you find your way to nonviolence international because you've been with them now for what 30 years almost yes yes indeed well uh, uh i went to the university of delaware my hometown my father was a professor and in fact Uh, he was a professor of history who started teaching Gandhian studies uh at the University of Delaware through the history department and uh, he was very concerned as a history of technology specialist that nuclear weapons and and uh, other kinds of modern technology although having <clears throat> some advantages might destroy the planet and cause an in new incredible suffering so he's very concerned about how technology needed to be used responsibly and not just willy-nilly and started teaching about gandhian in the in the nuclear age gandhianism is the nuclear age and so i was exposed to quite a bit of this through uh, my father uh, who was questioning nuclear power nuclear weapons and trying to understand that i went to the university of delaware and uh was a, a big big activist but uh a big impact on my life came the year before college i took a year off and i encourage other people to do this it's called a gap year typically is the language we use in the united states and between high school and college i went for a year and studied in malaysia and lived with a uh a malay family a muslim family in malaysia i learned malay and i was exposed to a universe of peoples and languages that didn't involve europeans and european americans i uh, malaysia has many many people of south asian heritage particularly tamil and many people uh, of chinese heritage and so there were all these languages and religions and uh, it was a great learning experience for me uh that the universe i grew up in was not the only universe <laughs> and uh i also learned that racism and discrimination uh and conflict can happen outside the context of europeans and european americans of course europeans had 
through the era of colonialism and really dominated the world. But here I was in an, an environment where there were no European Americans and yet there was racism and discrimination and challenges. And so uh, it was a real eye opener uh, for me uh, in life. And I would encourage others uh, who are interested, particularly young people, but to take gap years between perhaps high school and college uh, to get this kind of experience. Great. Uh, and then did you go to college also to deepen your knowledge and your uh, methodological um, skills in nonviolence or did you do something else in college? My college experience was interesting. I nominally took courses and had got a degree in geology. Uh, and at the same time, I was a, I tell people I have a self-awarded degree in activism. I was just a raging activist in college. Uh, working University of Delaware. At the University of Delaware. And I worked on so many human rights issues. And I had felt that because I had been exposed, uh, because of my upbringing and also my experience overseas to many kinds of human rights abuses and had an opportunity to reach all these young people who had just left their parents and didn't know much <laughs> and had an opportunity to organize young people. So this is back in the 1980s and I did a lot of work with the feminist movement, with lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, uh, rights with uh, working on South African and apartheid issues, um, uh, Palestinian justice issues, so many human rights issues. It was a joy and a privilege uh, in the, my college years. So I feel like I had a dual degree in geology and activism. And after college, I got into graduate school uh, in geology, but I chose to go into basically social change I was influenced very heavily by a man named Charlie Walker, uh, mm -hmm. who was a Quaker man in the United States who had done a lot of work with uh, 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 Gandhians and South Asians, um, uh, promoting the idea of the world brigades and the peace teams back in the 60s and 70s. And he's the founder or co-founder of the, of the Peace Brigades International. Right. And I was inspired by his work to bring nonviolence to the United States. Uh, as well as a man named George Willoughby, another mm -hmm. uh, well-known uh, Gandhian American uh, Quaker who uh, devoted his life to uh, civil rights and uh, protection of minorities. So these two men inspired me and I took a, a job with them immediately after college working at Peace Brigades International, which is a group that was inspired by Shanti Sena. That's right. And Shanti Sena was really the first attempt at nonviolent policing or what we call third party nonviolence. It's yeah. also in some uh, places now called civilian, unarmed civilian protection. Yeah. And the idea, of course, was to try to use third parties to bring about uh, peace or, or justice to, to communities. And, uh, so Peace Brigades was founded around 1980 uh, to uh, mostly, well, it was by, it was an international group right. uh, and including uh, some Gandhians from South Asia. And so we, we first started in, in Central America where the United States was supporting, government was supporting a lot of killing in, in that and repression there. And we used our international status, in many cases, our European uh, appearance uh, and, uh, and passports to go down and try to use that privilege to protect human rights defenders in the 1980s against assassination and kidnapping. And uh, that really helped launch the modern peace team movement. Okay. There are now many peace team uh, groups out there uh, there's the Nonviolent Peace Force. There's yes. uh, uh, there's some Shanti Sena brigades in various places, uh, Christian peacemaker teams, Muslim peacemaker teams, and others. So that's how I got started after college, is being inspired by these two basically Gandhian Americans uh, to yes. pursue a career of social change. Tiffany Tiffany Eastham has been part of our Himsa conversations. Wonderful. Yeah, I'll send you the link to her episode. Fantastic. So where, 
how did you then get involved with uh, the Nonviolence International? Because I know it's founded in 1989 and you have been with them since 19, I think, 98. Um, and that's a long journey for you. Uh, so can you give us an overview of uh, the story of Nonviolence International? Nonviolence International was started by Mubarak Awad uh, and a few of his colleagues. He was a well-known Palestinian activist who helped uh, promote nonviolence in Palestine and uh, helped really launch the first intifada uprising yeah. uh, in Palestine. He was known as the Palestinian Gandhi. Uh, he was so uh, scary for the Israelis uh, that they kicked him out of the country. They exiled him, even though he was born in Jerusalem. Uh, they said, well, you've been gone too long when he came to the United States to study You've been gone too long, so you lose your right to have a call yourself a, a citizen or a resident of this country. So uh, he said, "Look, I'm not just for nonviolence for Palestinians. I believe in nonviolence. Uh, even though my father was killed by the Israelis, I was raised with the idea that I don't want to kill anybody else, and I want to promote nonviolence around the world. It's not just a Palestinian uh, kind of idea." And so he came to the United States and opened this up and recruited me to come and join him in promoting nonviolence around the world. And we've just had a glorious ride. We've been have networks around the world in which we promote nonviolence. We're not limiting ourselves just to Gandhian nonviolence. Uh, we've been influenced by the work of researchers such as Dr. Gene Sharp, uh, who took more of a utilitarian approach, a more kind of power focused approach uh, uh, rather than a kind of an ethical approach to nonviolence. We're influenced by other religious uh, traditions, uh, whether it's uh, Christianity or Islam, Judaism, um, uh, Buddhism, uh, and others. Uh, so we feel like uh, the nonviolence universe is an exciting one. Mm -hmm. uh, there are a lot of differences of opinion, frankly, in the nonviolence universe. We think that's okay. Uh, we, we think the big family of nonviolence is a good one. And uh, that's, it's been a great uh, privilege to work yeah. with people around the world. In, in fact, one of, one of your uh, projects uh, in Nonviolence International is called The Many Faces of Nonviolence. Yes, so it sure is. Could you we, just say a bit more about that? Yes, the many faces of nonviolence is the uh, based on the idea of what you're doing, which is that people people have stories to tell, and that we learn through stories, and that we can learn through other people's experience. And we believe there are many nonviolent heroes and sheroes out there in the world, particularly often young people, whose voices need to be heard more. And uh, we want to tell the stories of nonviolence in all of its manifestations. Mm -hmm. And so we've done that now also with a spotlight series similar to what you're doing, which is a YouTube series uh, on our web channel, uh, youtube.com uh, slash nonviolence. And we interview a lot of young people about what nonviolence is in their lives today. Mm -hmm. You've also been to Myanmar. Could you talk about that? Because I'm curious to know, um, how does it work out when you go to a place where there is a deep-seated uh, and a kind of prolonged uh, systemic violence opera operating? Uh, and you go there with the mission of nonviolence. So for, in that context, what was the experience of Myanmar like? And in what period were you working there? We worked there a lot in the 1990s um, and early 2000s. Uh, I went there uh, with George Lakey in 1990, a well-known uh, uh, leader and thinker and activist in nonviolence to teach at a uh, ethnic uh, university in the jungle in guerrilla held territory uh, on the Thai side of the Burma, uh, uh, of Burma and uh, then went back repeatedly with a Colonel uh, Bob Helvey, who was an acolyte of Gene Sharp, who was trying to persuade these guerrillas and arms, armed groups that nonviolent struggle was really the more 
uh, likely way that they would get liberation. We didn't go into them and tell them as foreigners that using violence is wrong. We went in saying, you know what, using violence is not as effective as using nonviolence. So we used the effectiveness kind of uh, approach. Uh, and uh, over the years, uh, I think the people of Myanmar have struggled mightily, particularly the people inside for liberation and uh, have largely been nonviolent. The uh, violence we see now in Myanmar is emerging significantly. People feel like nonviolence has not succeeded, uh, which is true. It hasn't. But of course, they've been at civil war uh, also for 70 years, and that hasn't worked either. So, uh, but people are frustrated, and uh, I'm concerned that many people are using violence now, thinking that this is going to defeat the military. But we all know that the military there, as all militaries, that they know how to do violence best. They train for it. They have a lot of resources. And they will do a lot more killing uh, and succeed if, if the battleground is, a, is a, of a violent one. The military has the big advantage. So I'm trying to work with uh, uh, many of the people of Myanmar to to maintain a nonviolent pressure on the regime to reverse the coup. One of the things that I would like to share with your audience today is that one of the approaches that we're taking with people like this who are using violence is to talk to them about the recent research that Erica Chenoweth and Maria Stefan did about 10 years ago, uh, looking at nonviolent struggles and violent struggles over the last 100 years and doing some statistical analysis. And by doing that, they realized that twice as many nonviolent struggles uh, were succeeded as violent struggles. But more important than violence and nonviolence, they realized that maximizing participation was the key variable that showed success versus not success. Yeah. And so we are talking to the Burmese as well as we are to people around the world that we want to create social change movements in which we maximize participation because statistically that seems to be the best, have the best outcomes. And we want success. I mean, success is something we really want. And it's not some, you know, intellectual idea. We want people to be free. Yeah. And uh, one of the things that happens when you go to a violent struggle is that it's really a way for young men to capture power and to exclude women, seniors, and children substantially from a social change movement. And so there's actually a feminist idea here that in order to succeed, we don't want young men capturing uh, the movement and excluding others. How do we see then a struggle like Egypt? Because one of the challenges that the skeptics, the people who are skeptical about nonviolence, uh, you know, pose is that, well, look, there was a successful nonviolent struggle in Egypt. It got a regime change. And then in a short period of time after that, it looks like it's back to square one. How do you see a sequence like that? Well, it certainly is very disappointing and the people of Egypt, I feel really bad for them because they're suffering a lot. Uh, it's true uh, that nonviolence does not guarantee success, and but violence or anything in life, you cannot guarantee success and you have to uh, uh, maintain uh, the struggle for um, uh, what you believe is right. Uh, we have a situation in the United States where our democracy after a few hundred years is at risk, uh, like we haven't seen in quite a while. It, it, you have to maintain it and you have authoritarianism in India uh, in a way that you haven't uh, seen uh, in quite a while. And you have to struggle for democracy. You have to struggle for human rights. And uh, there was the big defeat in Egypt. The uh, the, the forces of change splintered uh, and could not unify, and the military uh, uh, took advantage of a splintered opposition uh, to take power. So 
there are no guarantees in life. We have to work and continue to maintain our vigilance for democracy, human rights, um, uh, and peace. And if you let up your guard or you splint, you, you make some poor decisions, there can be some bad actors who in many cases think they're doing the right thing for national you know, glory or whatever it is, uh, who take advantage of mistakes. And um, I, yeah. Uh, as you said, there are so many uh, voices and so many versions of nonviolence, but broadly, uh, yes. It is perceived that there is the Gandhian approach, which is, and I think Martin Luther King is also very close to that, yes. which is anchored uh, in faith, uh, uh, whether or not you bring God, bring, bring God into the picture. So yes. it's anchored in faith and definitely it makes a moral demand on the practitioners. Yes. Uh, by comparison, the uh, uh, the uh, work of Jean Sharp is yes. uh, sorry, my phone rang. Let me just put it on uh, airplane mode. Uh, does the work of Jean Sharp seem comparatively uh, more tactical or almost purely tactical? What is your assessment of this? Uh, where because I know there is a meeting ground also. So in what ways are these irreconcilable and to what extent is there a meeting ground between these two broad streams? Yes, I think it's a great question. Generally in life, I recommend to young people that you ask two questions of yourself when you make decisions, either personal decisions or decisions for uh, your group or your company or your community. What is the right thing to do? And what is the effective thing to do? And you should ask yourself those questions about many mundane matters of life. What is the right thing to do? What is the effective thing to do? And you need to make a choice uh, based on those questions. Uh, sometimes they'll line up very nicely. Sometimes they won't line up very nicely and you still have to make a choice on what to do. And so I think that it is fair to uh, portray these two camps the way you've done in this dualistic fashion. Uh, and people have to make the decisions for themselves. What is the right thing to do and what is the effective thing to do? We have uh, a group here in the United States primarily called the Plowshares, who since 1980 have been breaking into nuclear facilities and military bases uh, uh, primarily from a Christian uh, motivation to beat uh, swords into plowshares. And they think that uh, nuclear weapons are absolutely uh, unacceptable and can't be uh, allowed to just sit around because they could exterminate all of humanity within a few hours. And so they had go in and, and bang their hammers on these nuclear cones because they think it's the right thing to do. Do they think it's effective? They don't know. They're primarily motivated out of doing the right thing. And for them, that's more important than being, quote unquote, uh, you know, effective. They, they say, you know, we'll leave that in God's hands. Hopefully we'll inspire other people. Uh, and that the, through inspiring other people and setting example and sacrificing uh, maybe this change will happen. You then have typically an, another type of group, uh, particularly labor unions that use strikes around the world. Many of them are not necessarily terribly motivated to be really caring about their employers, uh, for example. Uh, they're motivated because they're suffering or because they really want uh, better wages or better work conditions. And so they look at a strike uh, from a non-cooperation standpoint and non-violence standpoint, and they use that because it's an ineffective thing to do. I mean, they're not motivated to go kill the employer. So, you know, clearly they are non-violent in certain respect, but they're really coming at, at it from a utilitarian or effectiveness kind of standpoint, power standpoint. And so we do see these different actors uh, using non-violence for different reasons. 
Uh, and we at Nabas International want to embrace both in, in, when we can, even though we know that there are often uh, conflicts uh, and uh, between these. Would it be fair to say that one of the major distinguishing features is that in the Gandhian approach, you seek to change the heart, to change the mind yes. of the opponent, whoever your opponent or uh, your other is. That's Whereas right. uh, in the more tactical, or as you, I think very rightly are calling it the utilitarian approach, um, the objective is to outmaneuver, uh, not necessarily to raise the moral conscience or put your faith rather in raising the moral conscience of the other. Is this a fair uh, distinction? Yes, I think it's a fair distinction. And it's probably most useful to see it on a spectrum, not just two distinct camps, okay. but there's a range of um, uh, ex uh, persuasion on one end to a, a kind of extreme coercion on the other. And I think sometimes uh, 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 we're a little unfair because I think it sometimes Gandhians do use uh, coercive uh, dimensions uh, more than they perhaps uh, recognize. Uh, when You're they're referring doing, here perhaps to the fasts. To, to the fast. fasts or, you know, when, when you engage in, in, in the boycotts of, uh, of goods, you really yeah. are, as happened back way back in the 1920s uh, and 30s of, of British uh, textiles. You know, you did have yeah, lots of British textiles those, mills who suffered. And the Soweto, uh, and, the Soweto boycotts. In and South the Soweto Africa. boycotts, sure. And uh, on the other hand, you also have uh, uh, examples of labor unions who, who really are nonviolent and are trying to not just persuade the employer, but they're trying to persuade uh, the community also, you know, let's say that they're a, 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 a public public service, they're teachers, uh, or they, they work for the public transit. They know that they need to get support from the public, not just from the elite power holders who make the, the wage changes. But if they don't get really support from the public for their cause, that they're not going to be able to sustain the improved work conditions or work pay. And so they do use lots of elements of communication. And yeah. almost all human behavior, even coercive behavior uh, does have an element of communication built into it. You are communicating in some ways uh, uh, your message and what you stand for. So it's most um, uh, nonviolent struggles involve a combination of persuasive and coercive. I think most would agree that ideally uh, the, more, the more persuasive you can uh, uh, try to use as much persuasion as you possibly can and as little coercion as yeah. you can to get what you want. Yeah. Um, no, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, go ahead. You finish your no, point. I would just finally say that there are some scholars such as Dr. Mary King who believe that the persuasive um, uh, approach uh, does not uh, show a lot of success, at least short-term success, uh, in the history of nonviolent struggle, and goes and uh, examines in particular the struggle in Kerala uh, around the uh, untouchable Dalit people who were excluded from the uh, temples and whatnot, and shows in great detail that, at least as far as she's concerned, that persuasion in that campaign was not successful and uh, contrary to popular myth and that uh, most struggles uh, indeed uh, have significant elements of coercion and, and that uh, we should be uh, uh, frank about that. We should, we should look at it honestly and not delude ourselves into thinking that persuasion is more uh, often successful than it really is. Now that's her, you know, that's her scholarship, yeah. but what point people to it if they'd like to read that some more. Well, if we were to, uh, you know, if we were to look at this at, uh, in a sense, a higher degree of complexity, then we have to consider uh, the central place in the Kingian framework of the beloved community. And uh, 
I think it's about how much does the new world that you're trying to create require a much larger um, buy-in for nonviolence, right? Because yes. uh, I, as you were speaking, I was remembering uh, the Seattle protests of 1999. And that was a classic, I think, confrontation from within the nonviolence camp, if I remember it correctly. Uh, and we've had one guest who spoke about an Indian activist who was present in Seattle on that day, on those four or five days. So uh, it was overwhelmingly nonviolent in yes. every way, spirit and action. But we also know that a segment of the nonviolent protesters believed that destruction of public property can still be within the nonviolence framework. Yes. And uh, the end result, if I remember correctly, was that the global media coverage all focused on the destruction of shop windows, etc. And uh, that was used uh, to depict the entire protest as being uh, either violent or at least not nonviolent. So how, how do you grapple with these dilemmas? Uh, because uh, I understand that the quest for the beloved community is not the quest for a monoculture. And yet, how do we creatively grapple with these, these very genuine differences? Yes. Um, the... Most social change struggles we have are not uh, uh, pure uh, nonviolent movements or pure violent movements. Even the great uh, Indian South Asian resistance to the British colonialism uh, that was led by uh, Mohandas Gandhi and Abdul Ghaffar Khan uh, was not 100% nonviolent. There were, uh, uh, there were, as you know uh, well, uh, there were those that used violence. Um, and uh, there are also violent struggles where there are also nonviolent components. Yes. Uh, in, in lots of wars, there's also lots of nonviolent resistance, for example. Yes. So uh, there's a mixture. Uh, what we do uh, see is that a, a little bit of violence um, uh, it can be a little bit like a sand in a gas tank. You might have a little bit and it might not uh, damage the car, but you put too much sand, too much violence in the uh, gas tank of a, of a vehicle, uh, sorry, a petrol, a petrol uh, in a, in a vehicle and the vehicle won't work. And we see this, I think, a lot with, uh, with violence that you, uh, if you have too much violence, it's going to contaminate the struggle and often uh, 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 damage the struggle very much. So um, I think we aspire towards uh, the beloved community. I think that uh, it's ex extremely important idea uh, and beyond what Dr. King talked about in terms of beloved community uh, of, of humans, uh, we have spiritual traditions, particularly Hinduism uh, and Buddhism, but others um, uh, in the modern ecology movement who are talking about the beloved community of, of all living things or all sentient beings uh, as being a framework to operate from. Uh, we don't want the people uh, of Burma to feel like they're going to have to kill other Burmese to get liberation. We don't want people uh, to uh, engage in wholesale destruction of the environment to make money, uh, to fight for their, uh, you know, community to have jobs uh, at the at the result of, of helping destroy the planet. Uh, planet's ecosystem. So I think that this beloved community is something that, and compassion, which of course the Buddhists talk about so in such a lovely way, uh, the compassion for, for life 
is so, so important for uh, the world to survive. We have some major existential crises in front of us. Yeah. We've got nuclear weapons. We've got the ecological crisis of climate change and all of the related ecological crises that really are uh, barreling down on us in, in a very, very severe way. We have uh, genetic engineering uh, coming at us that might extinguish what we know as humanity uh, because we'll start inventing superhumans and uh, we don't know that that will be the end of perhaps humanity. And then finally, artificial intelligence. We're reaching the place where we're inventing brains and intelligence that's much greater than our own. And this is a very severe, uh, still in, in the lifetime of the young people, uh, possible that we may exterminate humanity because we invent an intelligence much, much greater than our own. So we have these major ex ex existential crises. And unless we have the beloved community as our front and center, rather than uh, political power plays or scientific adventurism that is very narrowly focused on, on, on benefiting a few people rather than everybody, uh, we're going to not be able to to survive, let alone thrive in a in a, in a just world. Yeah. So you raise good question around beloved community and violence. Yeah, in a recent monograph that you have uh, done, uh, Michael, it's it's titled "Civil Resistance Tactics in the Twenty First Century." Uh, you have brought together a very hopeful picture, I think, of <clears throat> what are the positive possibilities. So could you summarize that yes. for our listeners? I would be delighted to. I hope everybody will uh, jump on the chance to, to read a book, which people don't do much nowadays. Uh, it's not a long book, and it's uh, free, PDF, or a, a, a very modest uh, price for a, a, an e-version. And so the book really surveys the field of nonviolent tactics now in the 21st century. Gene Sharp did this in 1973, and I've surveyed it now. And we see that there's enormous amounts of creativity and nonviolent struggle going on in so many different dimensions with so many different new kinds of methods and tactics. And particularly in the digital realm, now that we have the internet, there are a whole new field of arenas of not just nonviolent communication, uh, but nonviolent non-cooperation and intervention. And we want people around the world to realize that if they're in despair, that they should go to this toolbox, the book. And then I have a database too that goes along with it where we're adding every day uh, new tactics and new examples of tactics. And people can say, wow, I never thought of that. Maybe I can try that in my circumstance. We're up to 350 tactics that we have in our database. You can find that at the Nonviolence International website. And we would ask all of you to join us and make it your database and let us know of new examples and new tactics that we can put in the database to inspire people to realize that the toolbox of nonviolence is enormous and growing. And there's a lot of creativity. I do talk in the book about some of the difficult areas of property destruction, of self-mutilation, of uh, other areas that we don't always consider a pure kind of Gandhian nonviolence, but are on the margins, uh, and uh, but are realities in terms of how social change movements uh, operate today. And I don't pass a lot of judgments about rightness or wrongness, but do let people know that there is this great cloud and family of, of tactics and approaches uh, that people can learn from and make decisions about. So please join our effort to grow the toolbox of nonviolent tactics for everybody in the world to enjoy. Excellent. You uh, have a very reaffirming note I, I saw in the book where you say that uh, Power of nonviolent social change is shaping the world every day. Oh, it and is. We, and we know this to be true. And at the same time, the paradox is that 
uh, we are at an unprecedented uh, distortion of power. Much of what, uh, say, we grew up on, the expectations and hopes that we had in the 60s and 70s, even in the 80s, that the world was moving towards greater democratization, greater uh, humanization in the sense of more, uh, that the violations of human rights would become the exception. That was the expectation. In that sense, um, it is a paradox that on the one hand, there is this dynamic uh, use and, and practice of nonviolence in everyday life. And at the same time, as you just pointed out through your listing of the existential crises, uh, we are in a more dangerous position than ever before. Uh, yes. So how do you live with this? I mean, because you do it on a daily basis. Yes. You must, yes. It's a, must be a personally a challenge for you. That how do you live with this paradox? And nothing illustrates it more than climate change. Because... We can all try to do very good and responsible things in our daily life, but we know that that is not what is going to stop climate change until the big players uh, change what they do. So how do you live with that? Well, you ask a great question. Uh, we live in an enormously complex world now, uh, like we've never seen before. And we've seen great progress in many respects. Uh, in our lifetime, just incredible pro uh, progress in terms of human freedom uh, in our lifetime in certain respects. For example, the role of uh, women uh, in our lifetime in many places in the world, particularly urban places, has changed dramatically yeah. uh, in a lifetime. Uh, we've also seen enormous changes for lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender people around the world who we mean to understand now probably make up at least 10% of the world's population, at least 700 million people in the world uh, are lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender. So we're talking about an enormous groups of people that in the past have uh, not had substantial uh, freedom and now have significant freedom in many places. Um, so we've seen great growth in, in, in and indigenous people around the world really stepping up and were uh, people really taking on the caste system in, in India and the United States and other places where we still have vestiges of the caste systems. So uh, we're seeing good progress. Uh, at, and uh, other arena where we've seen a lot of good progress is we've seen the internet, which has uh, provided people an opportunity to get information and to communicate on a scale uh, that's unbelievable. And yeah. people like yourself can be a, uh, your own media group and, and, and speak to the world. Um, so we've seen just an incredible flourishing of, of human knowledge. And uh, one of the jewels of the internet is the Wikipedia, which is the people's encyclopedia. And this is a phenomenal success story uh, of decentralized bottom-up power making in which shapes everybody's mind. And yes, it's imperfect, but it is glorious in, in what it's done for so many people around the world. At the same time, we also know that we're much more interdependent, that we have actually more constraints on ourselves than we used to, because increasingly everything we do interferes with what other people do. If I use a non-disposable plastic item, it's going to come at an ecological cost. It's going to impact other people more and more and more. Uh, we're much more dense, uh, economically uh, connected in the world today. If we have a collapse of one economy in one part of the world, that can reverberate around the entire world now. We don't have to be, can't be just concerned with the economy of our own country. We have to be concerned with the economy of the entire planet. We also know now that Yes, computers and the internet has provided uh, uh, agency to so many billions of people, but it also provides the opportunity for governments to have enormous uh, control over citizens and people. Uh, and we see authoritarian governments now using computers to surveil people and to uh, uh, can try to control great populations. Look what the Chinese are doing with the Uyghurs and some of their populations uh, in, in China. It's really very disturbing. Uh, and the, the, the way that corporations in the West have profiles in every single individual uh, and 
know details that are just unbelievable about every single person and manipulate them uh, through advertising and, and, and communication. So we have this kind of mixture at the moment, great potential and great uh, threats of uh, authoritarianism because we, we are so interconnected uh, with each other. So I, I remain hopeful that we will succeed uh, to, to, to brush back the authoritarianisms and, the, and those that are trying to reduce freedom and justice in the world. And uh, nonviolence is the only way to go. What are we gonna use? Guns to like kill the corporations or, you know, we're not gonna defeat the authoritarians who have militaries. Of course, we need to get rid of militaries in the world. That would be yeah. a great thing. We need to follow Costa Rica. And, uh, but the, the way to go is to, to, to disarm the world and, and to move uh, in a bottom-up approaches on the climate change front. Yes, we need to do top-down stuff, but there is a lot that people can do in their communities uh, to, 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 make, to make the world that we need to see. So, Michael, in closing, what advice or what uh, of, from your inner work See, because yes. work like this requires a lot of inner strength and inner uh, uh, discipline. Yes. So what uh, would you share with young people who want to, who are, who are already marching down this path? They are committed in principle to nonviolence, but sometimes they feel daunted. Yes, of course. About how to do it. So what, what advice would yes. you share with them in closing? Uh, I would uh, say two things. One is follow the maxim, uh, think globally, act locally. Uh, and that really, think globally is also kind of a faith uh, statement that says, think about the world and the universe, not just yourself. And a lot of the religions are really great at this, at basically having people think about that which is greater than oneself, but then act locally. And sometimes uh, we, we, in order to not feel helpless, you need to focus on something reasonably that you have control over. Uh, the circle of concern versus the circle of control. Do something that you have control over, work in your local community, focus on one campaign and one issue. Don't try to do everything. Focus on a campaign for six months or a year, set some goals and get some victory and some achievement. That would be one. I would say the other suggestion here is you're not alone. And don't operate like a, to use an American expression, like a lone cowboy. We operate in community, whether that's a faith-based community or your peers, build community, build relationships, work together in groups, uh, a small group of people as Margaret Mead can change the world. And if you work in community, that can help sustain you uh, in your activism and give you great joy in, in life. So those would be what I would suggest on how to move forward and, and help make the world a better place. Namaste, thank you so very much for thank giving me the opportunity you. to thank speak. Thank you, thank you so much, Michael.